Good morning. Good to see everyone here on December 31st, everyone at our Warrensburg campus. Uh, I'm always on December 31st thinking everyone is sitting here half asleep this morning. So everyone just kind of do a big yawn and stretch. Okay, wake up a little bit. How many of you are, um, how many of you actually came on December 31st with the thought, I'm actually starting my year off right by being in church, getting ready to go, even though, okay, that's good. I'm glad to hear that. I thought there were a number of people that would be approaching today with that mindset. And with that um, mindset in place, that's why I decided to preach what I'm preaching right now. Uh, we're talking, the series title is called Teach Us to Pray um, from both Matthew and um, Luke. They give the Lord's Prayer and they watch the Lord praying and they want to know how they should pray. Lord, teach us to pray. They're watching him pray and it inspires them to know how to pray. pray. And so I'm going to give you um, probably a challenge to the way you even think about or conceive the, the idea of preaching uh, or the idea of praying and uh, hopefully it'll move you in a positive way more than a challenge. Hopefully it'll draw you in to a relationship of prayer moving into this next year um, so that you're growing in your walk with Christ. Now, 81% of Americans say they believe in God, but only 55% say they pray. Why is the difference there? If you believe in an all-powerful God who wants to know you, the creator of the world, and can provide for you, why wouldn't you talk to him more and say, hey, God, um, I need your help today with this. Probably most of you that are in church do this. This is more indicative of the world maybe outside of the church. My guess is that probably everyone here has some sort of prayer life, unless you're not yet a follower of Christ and you're considering and thinking about it. And even you um, it, it found out even people that weren't Christians um, or weren't believers in a faith often prayed to God in times of distress because it was kind of one of those Hail Marys. If he's up there, you know, I better just be safe and talk to him real quick and ask him to help me out. There's an old saying, there's no atheist in foxholes. In other words, when the bombs are blasting overhead, everyone starts praying in the foxhole just in case. And so we want to move from the just in case prayers to a deeply connected relationship with God. There was a study that I found really interesting this week, and I actually want to read a little more on it. Um, Jeffrey, or Jeff Levin from Baylor University um, teaches about, um, he's actually an epidemiologist, and he was kind of curious about how people that prayed, how it affected their health, and of course, people that prayed um, found themselves feeling far fewer symptoms of um, the sicknesses that they had, and they hypothesized that maybe, and what it seemed to be, was that they considered if the one big thing in the world was right, their connection with God, then everything else that was wrong seemed small because the big thing was in place and was good. And what he found about people that prayed, it was interesting. He did a study to say, so what kind of people pray? What leads people into prayer? What maybe keeps people from prayer? And this was a part I found most interesting. He asked a series of four questions, and in those he determined whether people felt an actual, personal, deep, loving connection to God on the basis of their personal feelings towards God and what they believed that God's feelings were towards them. And if there was a very holistic view of, I feel deeply in love with God, my creator, and I feel that God, my creator, has a deep love for me, they said those people prayed with uh, almost effortlessly. It was like they didn't try to remember, and it wasn't hard to pray. Loving connection just meant prayer. And those who felt very obliged religiously to pray were much less likely to be prayers than those who felt no obligation but felt personally, deeply, lovingly connected. Isn't that interesting? And it, what it does is it makes me say, if you don't have a prayer life that's consistent, I wonder if you feel religiously obligated to pray more than you feel personally and passionately in love with the person of Christ, of God himself. Think of it this way. Some of you may have had to visit with people over the holidays that are kind of hard to hang out with, and it's work, and it's like, 
Okay, we got to go to their house and we got to spend time with them. And, and some of you, on the inverse of that, you went and spent time with people that you love to see and love to hang out with. I was hanging out with my brother-in-law and sister-in-law in Chicago with my wife. And we, at one point in the evening, her brother and I just said to each other, we're standing in the kitchen. He says to me, he says, Matt, I just love it when you guys come. It's like we haven't missed a beat. It's just like we just get you guys and you get us. And, and we are both like, absolutely, we feel the exact same way. It's no challenge. It's no problem. It's no obligation for us to spend time with him because it's so easy. It's so natural. What's your relationship with God like? Is it so easy and so natural and so connected and loving that for you to pray just is like easy. It's like, of course I do. My relationship with him is just so easy and natural that I just do it all the time. I talked to someone a couple weeks ago and they said, you know, I've been work growing and trying to grow and spending time with God and praying and in the word. And they said, something's happened with me. I find God so connected and close to me that I'm like talking to him all day long and I'm not trying to remember to talk to him all day long. I just feel very connected to him. I feel very connected. What if prayer was a connection rather than an obligation? How would that change your prayer life going into 2024? And what could happen in our lives that would lead to that being more and more the case for us? And so we're gonna focus on the disciples' question when they come to Jesus and they say, teach us to pray. Before I do that, I just wanna share this one verse. Psalms 84, verse 10. Sometimes the Psalms can sum up the heart of a relationship with God so well, and this one does. And so I wanna read it. It says, for a day in your courts, in God's courts, is better than a thousand elsewhere. Anywhere else I could be, I would rather just a moment with you is better than all my other moments in life. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. He said, just, just to be with you is so rewarding for me and so meaningful for me. I, I love it. And even if I'm just at the door, even if I'm just letting people in the doorkeeper, I'm letting others in, even if that's all I'm doing, it's still so meaningful for me to be connected and to be close. I love that I, I, I read that and I think, I think he means it. He's not trying to sound like, oh, I'm really into God. That's a deep personal expression from someone. That's an original thought. We go back and read it and it's a repeated thought. But that's an original thought written down from a heart that's deeply connected to God. And when God looks down and he hears, like I heard the person a couple weeks ago saying, I just feel so like connected to God. I'm just talking to him all day long. There was no practice pattern of words where they were repeating something, trying to sound holy. It was a very natural expression that came from their relationship. I want to wonder as God is listening to your consideration of prayer in this moment, what he's hearing is the natural expression of you like, Oh, that sounds easy, but I'm really busy and I can't do that. Or if he's like, oh, I feel that way too, God. That's, I just love being with you. I just love my times with God. I wonder what God is hearing. And so I love that natural expression. So the disciples, let's read here. Luke chapter 11, verse one. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place. Do you have a certain place where you pray? What, what is it? Is, is it your chair? Is it your office? Is it your car as you drive? Jesus had a certain place. The disciples saw it and they knew it. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. As John taught his disciples. It, it's like there's this awe, this inspiration that's happening right there. And they're actually watching. Could you imagine this? Try to put yourself in this moment. You're standing off at a distance and Jesus is in a certain place praying. And maybe you got up earlier than the rest of the disciples and gradually some of the others crept up beside you and they're like, what's he doing? They're like, well, he's praying like normal. Just he's over there talking to his father. And your hearts kind of grow and well up and you're like, wow, listen to him pray. He has such an intimate, I, I never prayed like that. I never thought of God as my father the way he thinks of him. He, it's like, it's personal for him. It's like he knows God personally and connects with God. He's just talking to him like he's his 
Abba, Father, is, is Daddy. And he finishes up and, and he finally stands up and he dusts his knees off as he's been down on the ground. And he walks over and the disciples are kind of like, oh, we weren't peeking, you know, we were just hanging out over here. We weren't being weirdos watching you pray. And he walks over and they're like, hey, Jesus, could you teach us to pray like that? John, like he taught his disciples how to pray and, and we watch you pray and we wish we, we could talk to God the way you talk to God. Now, how many of you in this room, if you could do that and be in that moment, would be listening very attentively to what Jesus was about to say? Hands up, anyone? So that's what we're about to listen to as we read the scriptures this morning. We're about to hear the answer to that question. Let's continue and read. I'm going to be jumping around a little bit. I'm going to pause for just a moment. We get the Lord's Prayer next. Pray our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. He prays, he gives them the Lord's Prayer. It's a pattern of prayer, okay? Next week, we're going to talk about the pattern of prayer. We're going to go backwards next week. This week, though, we're going to talk about the heart of prayer. After he teaches the pattern of prayer, he teaches the heart of prayer. And so today, we're learning about the heart of prayer. Everyone say, we're learning about the heart of prayer. Okay, so let's start with this. Now we're going to jump to Luke 11, verse 5. And he said to them, which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, do not bother me. The door is now shut and my kids are in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he's his friend, yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be opened. Now, I'm going to pause for just a moment. Everything Jesus is teaching is lesser to greater, okay? We've been hearing lesser. Now we're moving to greater. What father among you, he's changing the person from a friend who's annoyed to a father now, what father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead give uh, instead of a fish, give him a serpent. If he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? As I read this, I've thought of this teaching in the ask, seek, and knock um, relationship and um, kind of um, just that emphasis on trusting God and coming to him repetitively. But as I looked deeper into it and studied the passage, I realized that this is a unique teaching. Jesus occasionally teaches from lesser principles to greater principles. And not that the lesser principles are wrong, but they're kind of starter positions. And we move from a starter prayer to an advanced prayer, from a starter relationship to an advanced relationship, from a starter request to an advanced request. And that's what happens in this, in this prayer. And so we're going to look at those three things. And, and we're going to look at kind of the lesser and then the greater as we learn to pray. And my goal today is that as we spend some time, the first 21 days of the prayer, of this prayer and fasting. Um, and by the way, we're going to be having our first worship night. That'll be next Sunday night is when we're going to have our first encounter night here at the church at 6 o'clock. But I'd like us to even be this week moving from a lesser to greater position in the way we connect and pray with God. So the first one, you can go ahead and write this down. Number one is this. Jesus wants to reframe who we imagine we are asking. I know that's a little bit long, but I'm going to have everyone here. And in Warrensburg, can we all read this together? Let's read it together. Jesus wants us to reframe who we imagine we are asking. Verses five to seven, and he said to them, which of you who has a what? Friend. 
a friend. So we're starting with a friend. Which of you has a friend will go to him at night to say to him, friend, leave me, uh, lend me three loaves for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I have nothing to set before him and he will answer him from within, do not bother me, the door is shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I just uh, imagine the friend maybe right outside the window. It's probably ground level there, and he's whispering in there saying, get up. And this was common in the Middle East. It was a shared bed. We imagine, you know, everyone has separate rooms. There was typically one room for sleeping and one area of that room where the whole family would curl up because uh, they didn't have central heating and central air. So uh, you would just curl up with everyone, and that's the way you kept warm at night. And so he's like, that's, that was common basically through the world, and still in some portions of the world it is. And so they're curled up, and the friend's outside, and he's whispering, and how many of you get the sense that the friend is annoyed? You can just hear the annoyance in this uh, dialogue right here. Leave me alone I'm already in bed. My kids are asleep. How many of you, if you're in bed and your kids are asleep, you don't want to wake up the baby and have them crying and have to put the kid back to sleep again? You remember those years, right? I'm almost picturing like he's got a a toddler or a baby, and he's like, "I, I just got everyone to sleep. I'm not about to move. And they're probably whispering back and forth. I can picture the way it might have been. And they're just going, no, I'm sleeping. Leave me alone. Come back tomorrow, you know. I don't want to wake the kids up right now. And, and this picture is um, what some of us have of God. Some of us imagine that everything we ask for is an annoyance. Like, God, uh, I know. And, and we imagine we're annoyed, God's annoyed, because we can think of everything we've done wrong in the last week. And so we're thinking, God, I know, like, I, I really messed up this day and this day and this day, but... I mean, if you please forgive me, but I really need a job right now. But I, I really need to figure out what's wrong with my wife, and we're fighting, and I don't know what I did, and I don't know what to do and how to fix it. And, and God, I really need help with one of my kids. And God, I'm really struggling, but I feel bad even asking because I know I'm probably annoying because I messed up so much. You ever felt like you messed up a lot, and maybe you should wait a while before you ask for something from God? Like, I, I'm, I kind of, you know, not a good week for me. I'll come back next week and bother you, God, because I know you got to be annoyed with me the way I've been messing up. And so that's, okay, it's like, okay, go ahead and ask. It's a shame that you feel that way. I wish you didn't think that way about God, but, but you do. And so ask and seek and knock and, and the friend will get up even because of your impudence. And so don't stop praying because you think you're annoying. Don't stop praying because you think you're annoying. How many say, that doesn't feel very good? And how many say, that might qualify as a lesser position in prayer? So what's he moved to? He moves to a father. And he starts talking about a father and the relationship that father will have with him. And I'll, I'll read verses 11. And, well, I'll, I'll just uh, read this. Verse 8, it says, I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend. Your friendship in cotton it. I'm sorry, I know your friend, but that's not enough to get me out of bed. Yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. I think there's a lot of people that have an impudence relationship, impudence relationship. They're just bothering God, and they're like, I'm just going to ask and ask God, come on, I need this. God, will you give me this? God, do this for me. I need you. How many of you ever felt like you're just an annoyance, and you just ask and ask and ask and ask, and you're hung up? There's that scripture. It says to ask and to seek and to knock, and I'm just going to keep pounding on the doors of heaven and asking and seeking and knocking because I'm determined. I'm doggedly determined. And whenever God doesn't, for those people, when God doesn't get up and provide something, they get really mad at God. I prayed, and I'll hear them tell me, you don't know how much I prayed, and I asked, and I believed, and I was praying hard, and God didn't answer me. And those people, they get really frustrated with God. Because they did this, and God didn't get up, and God didn't provide for them. But then you jump to this other relationship in Luke chapter 11, 11 to 13. It says, what father, everyone say father. 
So we've moved from friend to father now. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead give, um, instead of a fish, give him a serpent? Well, of course, none of you would do that. He's, Jesus is saying this, and everyone's like, well, of course, no one's going to do that. Um, or if he asked for an egg, will you give him a scorpion? That would be awful. Of course, you're not going to give, they're going to ask for something good, and you're going to give him something bad. No, you're not going to do that. So people are like, man, I prayed, and I asked, and bad things happen, and that's God's fault. And, and they're mad at God because they prayed for something, and then it all fell apart, and they blame it on God, and God didn't come through, and God let me down, and God let this terrible thing happen. I've seen Christians become so bitter at God. It says, what father among, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Something better than everything you've asked for. So is that the way you think of God? Whenever things go wrong, I, I want to challenge you to start this way and to say, when things go wrong in prayer, and you've done the praying and the asking, the seeking, the knocking, and you've been that impudent friend, you're just going after God. And then something comes back and it's not what you want. And it's absolutely the opposite of what you want. Now, I'm not gonna say this is all related to prayer because there are other principles. The law of sowing and reaping may be in effect. You've been sowing to the flesh, you may reap from the flesh corruption or destruction. So you can't just say, well, I prayed, I, I sowed to the flesh and did terrible, awful things to my life, and now I just threw a prayer up and asked God a whole bunch of times to not make me pay for any of my stupid decisions and stupid behaviors, and it turns out I experienced the law of sowing and reaping. He who sows to the flesh will the flesh reap destruction or corruption. He who sows to the spirit will the spirit reap life. So People try to get a bail out of, you know, jail card by throwing a bunch of prayers up after you sowed to the flesh, and then you're mad at God because God didn't answer your prayer. It ain't about your prayer, it's about your lifestyle in that situation, right? Okay, so don't get mad at God when you dug your own hole. You made your own bed, you get a lie in it a little bit. That's actually scriptural. If God delivers you, it's a wonderful act of grace, but he's not obligated to deliver you in that moment. He may, as a father, want to punish you. How many of you know that we have a father who sometimes disciplines his children? Okay? And that's a loving father, okay? But on the other side of this, back to this message here, I, I want to give you that caveat because people say, well, I did what you said, Matt, and it didn't work. And then I'm going to say, what are you sowing towards? But there's another side of this. How many of you know that the father can answer us better than we ask? The Father can answer us better than we ask as well because he's such a loving Father. We may ask for something that's not up to the level of what God would want to give. He's like, why are you asking for that? You want to marry that girl and I have someone way better for you. You want this job and I have a much better job for you. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but we have a loving Father. My stepdad, John, before he passed away, he had this candy drawer in his room and all the grandkids, when they would come over, they would know where the candy was. Do you know what the answer from John was about getting candy? It was pretty much always yes. We knew that as parents because they had not eaten lunch yet and they'd be running around with candy and we'd be like, where'd you get the candy? Grandpa's drawer. Once you heard it was grandpa's drawer, you had to let it go. Because it was their house and they were going to win on that one. Do you think of God that way? That's not a bad thought to say, I have a God who's very, very loving. And if I ask for something, he's not going to give me something worse. I'm not going to ask for an egg and get a scorpion. I'm not going to ask for a fish and get a snake. No, I have a God who's very, very good and a wonderful, gracious God. So when you think of God, when you go into prayer, my challenge right now is to this room and to everyone in Warrensburg and listening online, is to begin to reframe God and to begin to say, man, I, I always think of God as like down on me and against me and like I'm bothering him and I'm annoying him. But instead, I think he's a father who's really, really good to his children. In fact, he's so good that he's sometimes better than whatever I ask or think or imagine. He's got more. He's got better for my life because 
That's who he is as a father. The second thought from this passage, Jesus teaches us to expand our praying. So he's, he's uh, helping them to consider not just, you know, the words or how you ought to pray, but really the feeling or the heart or the emotion behind prayer. Think of God as a father to the disciples. Teach us how to pray. He's like, well, think of him as a father, not an annoyed friend. Because if you're very religious and ritualistic, you're always disappointing God and he's always mad at you and disappointed with you and not wanting to come to the door and meet you there. But that's not who he is. He's actually a much more loving father than any of you are to your children. So could we just think of him as a father who loves his children. When you go to prayer, think of him as father. Oh, and they probably thought, oh, I get it. When you pray, you're talking to him like he's, a, I, you talk to him like that, Jesus. I can see that. You're talking to him like he's a loving father. When I see you down on your knees and I'm standing off here and we're watching you pray, that's how you talk to him. That's why. Because you think about him different than we think about him. I need to think about God differently. How many of you would say, I need to think about God a little bit differently when I pray? I, I've got, God's got a little too much of a hard edge on him in, when I pray. And he doesn't have that soft, tender spot for me as a father. When I think about him, I think about his disappointment with me, not about his loving fatherly nature towards me. And so that's the first thing that we, we learn from that. Then Jesus then teaches them to expand their praying. Jesus teaches us to expand our praying. We can put that as a second point. I think I have a second point up here. If it doesn't come up, oh, there we go. Um, let's all read that together here in Warrensburg. Let's read it together. Jesus teaches us to expand our praying. In Luke 11, 9 to 10, it says, I tell you, ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And the one who seeks finds. The one who knocks, it will be opened. Asking and seeking and knocking um, may be the same concept and triplicate, just like come to God and he really, really, really will provide for you. It could be that. Um, I've heard it taught that way and I've read it that way. Um, another way to look at it, which I think is probably more fitting to the passage for a variety of reasons, um, is this idea that it's a progressive movement in prayer. Asking is whenever we're just doing what we do when we come to God and pray, God, will you provide? God, will you give me this? God, will you care for this? God, will you do something? We're asking for something from God. And I would say most people kind of, their prayer life is a lot of thanking and a lot of asking and, you know, asking for forgiveness or asking for provision or support or help or thanking God in some way. How many say you, a lot of your prayer life is uh, thanking and asking? And that's fine. Those are good. Come on up. Uh, a few hands, <laughs> okay, asking and thinking. And then we get to seeking. And probably some of you are involved in a seeking relationship with God. God, I, I don't know. I don't know what your will is. I, you taught us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Show me what your will in heaven is for my life on earth, for my career on earth, for my relationships right now. I'm seeking to know you and to know your will. How many of you have prayed a couple seeking prayers in the past? Lord, I need you to show me something I don't know and you do. Amen? And then there's this knocking. I believe that it's three distinct things because what happens when he knocks at the door? Well, the friend will finally come to the door and open the door. And what do you receive? Well, you receive the friend at the door and you receive the provision. I believe knocking is coming to God to know God, not just what God can give to you. And there's an example of this, and it's in reverse. In Revelation 3, verse 20, it says this. Jesus speaks here to his church, and he says, Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in, and we will share a meal together as friends. This is reverse. Jesus is knocking, but the idea is that open doors lead to fellowship. Knocking leads to fellowship with God. It leads to a door opened to experiencing God himself at the door. And so there's this part of prayer where we're not seeking direction from God and where we're not asking for God's provision or for God's forgiveness and we're not even in a thankful place. There's a place in prayer 
where you just get to know God for who he is and you're in fellowship and in relationship and you're experiencing God and his presence in your life. Someone give an amen on that one. And in the next portion we'll get to, we'll see how Jesus says he kind of supports that thought by the way he ends this teaching that we're talking about today. He really supports that thought of like prayer can lead to knowing God. Prayer can lead to knowing God, not just getting something from God. We think the Bible reading leads to knowing God alone, and it, it does lead to knowing God, but I can know God also through my prayer life. Like God can show up, his presence is there, a sense of him speaking or settling my heart, bringing peace to me, bringing a sense of his fellowship, his presence into my life whenever I'm needing it, a sense of his overpowering love has settled on me whenever I've been in prayer. Have any of you ever been in prayer and you felt more than just like God might answer, but you felt like God was actually there in the moments you were praying and with you in that moment and that his presence was like beautiful and powerful and peaceful and loving and come on, a couple hands in the room. Anyone, you've been there? Okay, so, so prayer might be asking I need something. Seeking, I need direction. And it might be knocking. Open the door and here I am ready to meet with you. And Jesus is teaching them to go from lesser to greater. That's wonderful that you need stuff. And and I'd love to show you direction. But you know what I'd really love is to meet you here as you knock and to have fellowship with you. Lesser to greater. Lesser to greater in the relationship. An annoyed friend to a loving father. Lesser to greater in the things we're looking for. I need stuff. I need you. And now we're going to look at the third lesser to greater. Jesus assumes a change in what we ask for. Jesus assumes a change in what we ask for. Let's read that together at both campuses. Let's read it together. Jesus assumes a change in what we ask for. Okay, so I'll give you this example. The woman at the well um, in John chapter 4, Jesus is talking to her and asking for water and and then um, she's like, why are you asking me? You know, I'm a Samaritan, you're a Jew and Jews and Samaritans don't have anything to do with each other. Jesus is responding. Jesus answered her and he says, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. In this example, he's saying you're asking for something so shallow. You're just wanting physical water to drink. You just want me to provide for you financially in your prayer. You just want me to give you a spouse. Those are great. There's nothing wrong. Of course, we need water to drink. We need provision. We need relationship. That's all wonderful. But if you knew who it was you were asking, you would have asked for living water And I would have provided that. And that's something much more meaningful in your life. Living water. Living water. Keep that thought in mind. Now let's listen to this teaching of Jesus and what we should be asking for. The greater ask in prayer. In Luke chapter 11, 11 through 13. What father among you, if his son asked for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? And if he asked for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the, what? The Holy Spirit to those who ask. This isn't part of the conversation. No one's asking him how to have more of the Holy Spirit. They want to know how to pray. And he says, you know the kinds of things you ask for? Yeah? He's like that's not how you should be praying. It's okay to ask for those things. That's fine. But if you knew who you were asking, you would ask for him. If you knew it was God when you showed up, you would ask to meet with God when you showed up. If you knew he was real and he was the divine sustenance for every human soul, And that nothing you eat or drink, no amount of money and no amount of provision could ever live up to the presence of God himself. The human life was created for the God who created human life. 
And all we want is the stuff on the planet that he created with us when we were meant to experience the God who created the planet. You would ask for living water if you knew it was God when you prayed. You would ask for the Holy Spirit, the very presence of God on earth. The Holy Spirit is God's presence in your life. And you want stuff. And all you do is spend your prayers asking for stuff. When stuff will never fill you, Jesus is the bread of life. He's the living water. And if we drink of him, we will thirst no more. It's the Holy Spirit filling our lives. How many prayers have been on the lesser end of the spectrum? Good things, but lesser things. And how much of your prayer life is dedicated to asking for God himself to be part of your life and to be present and to fill you for living water? Lesser to greater, is he a annoyed friend or a loving father to you when you pray, how do you sense him? What do you think of him? Are you moving from asking for stuff to asking to know him, knocking, I want to see you? Lesser prayers to greater prayers. That's the heart of prayer that Jesus teaches. And so as we're going into 21 days of prayer and fasting, in 2024, I'm hoping that God becomes our first priority. and That we begin to say, I, I just want to meet him. I want to connect with him. I want to experience God. And so in a few moments, whenever we pray, I'm going to ask you, to give up something physically. I'm going to ask you to say, I'm going to acknowledge that the physical has become a priority too much in my life. It's funny because we're coming out of Christmas where how many of you ate enough food over Christmas? How many of you got enough stuff over Christmas? This is an interesting timing of this. It's really interesting because where we are right now as Americans and in my personal life where I am, Matt Harris is, I've had plenty of food and plenty of stuff. But I've been awful busy and I need more of God. And so by fasting, I'm going to set aside some meal times to remind myself, this is not what it's all about. Another meal, another coffee, another, you know, whatever. Bacon, egg and cheese biscuit sandwich. Whatever it is, your thing is. It's not about that. I'm spending time in your presence and I'm communicating through my fasting, setting aside a meal. And, and, and here's, this is big, this is big. Because when you hear 21 days of prayer and fasting, you're like, oh my gracious, there's no way I could ever do that. And some of you, maybe medically for some reason you can't. Most of you can't because you're too hungry, okay, by day two. Me too, I get that. So here's what I'd like you to do to accept this challenge. Let's accept one challenge. Could we fast tomorrow morning's breakfast and pray? Anyone? Could we fast tomorrow morning's breakfast? Okay. So we're starting off the beginning of the year with fasting at least one meal. Now some of you are going to add that up and you're going to say, I'm going to fast the first day of this year for prayer and fasting. I'm going to just fast the whole day for prayer and fasting. Some of you have big family plans and meal and all that. I'm not asking you to change that. Some of you, I've, I talked to someone who was like, I think I might try to do like a meal a day. I might do, give my breakfast up and just spend that for prayer time with God. Other people are going to try to go the whole 21 days and they're going to be drinking water and juices or whatever. They might do a juice fast. I don't know what it is. But I think for a lot of us, we've never had the challenge and never, never pushed ourselves spiritually to a level where we said, I would give up a meal and spend it praying instead. And so for you, literally, if you gave up one meal tomorrow and you prayed, you'd be like, that's the most fasting I've ever done. And I'll high five you and say, way to go. You had a win. That's awesome. But what I'd love for you to do, here's the three things we're going to be focusing on. Everyone grab your little prayer guide there. Your little prayer guide. Okay, so you're going to be able to get ahead of me. I love this. You're going to get ahead of me. 
So I, I told you I'm going to be preaching the Lord's Prayer next Sunday. So you're going to study the Lord's Prayer every day this week, okay? So you're going to be studying the Lord's Prayer over this week, and then I'm going to teach it next Sunday. And so and that's what I'm doing each week. You're going to study, and then I'm going to preach on that. You're going to study it, then I'm going to preach on it. And if you get really good ideas, then you're going to email them to me, and I'm going to steal your good ideas, and I'm going to preach that, okay? Anyway. Sorry, there's a guy named Henry. Always comes up with great ideas after I preach. I'm like, dude, tell me that before I preach. He's like, well, I didn't know what you were preaching about. I'm like, well, I would have stolen that idea had I known it. Next service is going to get it. So we want to encourage you to follow along in prayer each day. And then starting next Sunday night, we're going to be having these times together where we're just going to worship at the end of a week of fasting and prayer. Probably a bunch of you are going to do like a meal a day. A few of you will do, you know, just an all-out fast. That's whatever it is. That's fine. I don't care. As long as you're just moving some fleshly things out of the way. Some people will do things like put aside TV or social media or something like that. Um, That's great. Whatever it is. The point is to put it into prayer. It's not like what you give up. Give up something. Give it to prayer. Don't just give up something. That's just called dieting. Giving it up is dieting. Putting Jesus in its place is called fasting. Okay? And this is a spiritual act of fasting. We're going to put take that daily devotional and say, when I would normally do this, I'm going to go through my devotional time. And I'm giving this to God and studying each of these days. And I'm going to pray over this as I do it. I think if we'll do this as a church, I'm okay. I'm just going to give you my heart. I believe God is going to do something amazing spiritually in our congregation in 2024. But I believe it has to be the entire church that owns the heart to see God bigger and more powerful and more richly filling our lives and our homes and our families. It can't just be Matt's vision. It's got to be all of us moving into this deeper walk with Christ. Amen? It really has to be an investment of the congregation into spiritual life and the spiritual growth. And if we could just start off together at the beginning of the year, it's going to be beautiful to see what God does. I'm going to ask you to stand. As you stand with me, I'm going to invite the worship team to come up and lead us for a moment. When the worship team comes up and leads us, this is what I'm going to ask you to do during, we're going to sing, you're worthy of it all. Lori's going to lead us here. And as Lori leads us in the song, You're Worthy of It All, you're going to have to consider of what it is that he's worthy of. What I mean by that, you're worthy of what? Breakfast tomorrow morning. (laughs) Well, he's worthy of it all, but start with something. Lord, you're worthy of, you know, I'm not eating till dinner every night. And I'm going to take my lunch hour to read the devotional in the morning to pray and I'm, you're worthy of this. This is what I'm going to do to spend time with you over this next 21 days. You're worthy of it all. I'm, I'm going to be at all three encounter nights on the 7th, 14th, and 21st. I'll be here. I'll bring my kids, and we'll be here. You're worthy of that. And we want to start the year off as a family seeking God in our home. My wife and I are going to read the devotional each night as we go to bed. You're worthy of that. I don't know. Don't do all the things. You'll just, you're piling up stuff and becoming legalistic if you try to do everything I say. I don't want you to do that. I I want you to seek God right now as we worship and just kind of consider this and let God start leading you and then maybe discuss it if you're married and say, I feel like maybe I, Sherry and I have been discussing it. What do we feel like we should do, I should do, she should do, and so that we're supporting each other and our focus spiritually during this 21 days. So as we sing, this is your moment, this is your time, start considering prayerfully how you'll be seeking God during these 21 days.